Hi, thanks for joining me today. I'm Peter Chubbow from Simulation Product Manager with Javelin Technologies, and we're here today to talk about why best-in-class companies use simulation early in the design process. Now, as we go through this today, we'll talk about the role of new product development in companies. We'll go through validation methods that we use to predict design and or behavior of new products. Then we'll talk about the changing role of simulation and early phase simulation use. So let's start with new product development. Now, new products are the backbone for most organizations these days, and over a third of a company's revenue can be earned from new products. In fact, a recent Aberdeen report um, shows that up, up to 37% of total revenue can come from new product introduction. Now, of course, competitive pressures are high to successfully deliver these new products. To beat their competitors, companies must get to market quickly with their products and have products that perform and deliver. Now, uh, Aberdeen's research has shown that the timely launch of a new product offers an organization the greatest opportunity for increased profitability. But at the same time, companies need a better understanding of product behavior to enable the innovations that are going to create those market opportunities needed for these new revenue streams. But as innovation increases within a product, so does the complexity of the product. And as a quick example of that, let's take a quick look at a 56 Chevy engine. And I'm sure some of you guys have worked on engines like these or seen engines like these before. Um, in an engine like this, you could jump right in there, change a spark plug or change the oil, no problem. Well, if we look at a Chevy engine today, you're hard pressed to find the dipstick, let alone change the oil on a car like this. And it's not a bad thing, things are getting better. But again, as they get better, they're getting more complex. And as the complexity of the products grow, so do the systems and processes we need to support them. In a recent Aberdeen Group survey, companies were asked to select the top two challenges they feel when determining the behavior of new products. And you'll see the results here. Um, products are becoming more complex. Products are operating in varying and complex environments. There's limited development resources to develop and test these products. Competitive, competitive differentiation is becoming more difficult. And design flaws just aren't tolerated. Well, looking at this, it's by far um, the by far the uh, the overwhelming challenge is complexity um, when trying to develop new products. So, what does this increased complexity lead to in designs? Well. As designs get more complex, the harder it is to evaluate different alternatives and different design choices. And this complexity isn't limited to specific industries. All products are becoming increasingly elaborate in the way they use mechanics, electronics, software, mechatronics, etc. And as things get more complex, the options and approaches we can take as designers and engineers, they get more complex too. The demands on us are still the same. We still need to know how these different options need to perform and how, the, um, uh, how this performance will affect the, the overall product performance. And then we need to use that data to make decisions in the design process. Well, how do we go about actually determining how a product will perform? Well, we'll talk about validation methods. And really, there's three methods that are, are typically used to predict product performance building physical prototypes, performing hand calculations, or using virtual simulation tools like CFD tools, FEA tools, and other numerical tools that can simulate complex systems. Well, these all have advantages and disadvantages, but you'll see things are moving more and more towards virtual simulation. And let's take a look at why. Well, building a physical prototype this is a very direct way to test performance of a product. And it's been done this way for a very, very long time. Since people had ideas, people have been building it and breaking it, seeing if it's going to work. And it's still prevalent in a lot of different industries, but that doesn't mean there aren't drawbacks. Now, when we look at challenges of physical prototypes, we'll go back to another Aberdeen Group survey here, um, and we ask companies to go through and, and uh, report the top challenges they faced with physical prototyping. And you'll see some of these. Uh, time required to build the prototypes. Cost required to build the prototypes. It's not just one prototype. Often there's multiple iterations of that prototype needed. The time required to test them. Limitations in the testing that we can can be performed, and sometimes the performance of the prototype doesn't match the final product. Well, certainly there's three big ones that stand out there. Time, 
They're not fast, they take a long time to do, which directly affects lead time and project deadlines. There's cost associated with them. And of course, these things can be stacked because it's not just a one-time thing. This can happen multiple times. So we know that prototypes are expensive. They're time consuming and they may not be representative of the final parts. And again, since we know multiple iterations are needed to get the results we want, the overall cost and waste can add up very quickly. Now, think about the multiple types of tests that might be required as well. We're not just talking about maybe one physical strength test. We might need to do structural testing, vibration testing, thermal testing, fatigue testing, etc. And we might need to go through this whole cycle with all those tests multiple times. Finally, when you throw in the fact that these tests can't be done early in the design cycle, um, usually they're at the end of the design cycle as verification tests, and they can be a huge bottleneck, especially when the tests don't go well. Um, if you're counting on that test to work and suddenly you have a part fail, you can be looking at days, weeks, or months of delays in manufacturing and new product introduction. So it's easy to see why physical testing is limited, expensive, and really not the best choice. Well, what about the old standby, hand calculations? Performing manual stress calculations has been done for literally centuries, and most engineers are familiar with the approach. Before we had the tools available today, they really were the best thing we could do as engineers and designers were calculate stress manually and, and see how close we are to failure. Now, um, we also went to an Aberdeen Group survey here asking companies what the top challenges were with hand calculations. And you'll see some of the responses here. Part geometries are getting too complex to really model by hand. Um, some things just can't be simplified. And the assumptions and simplifications needed to run hand calculations are lowering the accuracy of those calculations. Of course, they're not fast. Complex calculations require complex computation and, and a lot of time to perform them. Um, also, you can't optimize cost or performance with hand calculations. You can do spot checks on things, but there's no way a hand calculation is going to tell you the optimal way um, to build a part or the optimal material usage or optimal cost or pricing usage on a part. Sometimes these hand calculations don't predict failure location, just whether failure will happen or not. And it's difficult to collaborate with others on these. Whether it's physical hand calcs on paper or spreadsheet-based hand calculations, it's typically a one-person job. Might be validated later on, but it's not something that um, uh, it's not something that you can really do as a group effort. Now, um, the reality: hand calculations are simple mechanical formulas that require broad assumptions and simplifications of multiple factors: geometry, tolerances, loading, etc. And as the data shows, for everything but the simplest of part geometries, hand calculations are pretty much rough estimates of predetermined areas of concern. They're often just rough approximations of true stress levels in parts, and sometimes the margin of error on these can be quite big, so you end up putting big factors of safeties on parts and overbuilding them. So, with that, collaborating can be a challenge, accuracy can be a challenge, and we often compensate by overbuilding. Um, Hand calculations really aren't an effective way to predict product performance. So, what about the third and final approach to validation? Virtual simulation tools. This is the most robust of all the validation methods, and it's the methods that best-in-class companies rely on. In fact, best-in-class companies are 53% more likely than their peers to use virtual simulation tools over other methods. So, let's take a look at simulation's changing role today. Now, the numbers really speak for themselves. Best-in-class companies are 53% more likely than their peers to use virtual simulation tools. And have a look at the chart, guys, for people who are using virtual simulation. And then this question was basically, are you using virtual simulation tools? 75% of best-in-class companies are. And have a look at the industry averages and the laggards there. Um, pretty clear. The companies that are succeeding and doing the best at what they do are using virtual simulation tools up front. Now, um, simulation tools like FEA and CFD have been around for decades, but they used to be very hard to use. They used to be the realm of analysts and specialists only. You needed education, training, and expensive hardware to even run the simplest simulation cases. Well, that's no longer the case. 
In recent years, simulation tools have become drastically easier to use and much more tightly integrated with CAD tools like SolidWorks. The result is simulation tools that can be used by everyday designers and engineers as a tightly integrated part of the design process. So, what does this mean to prototypes and all their associated costs? Well, companies that use virtual simulation reported the following effects on prototyping. Well, 48% um, of companies reported reducing the total number of prototypes. 29% of companies said they could use more partial prototypes and less full prototypes. And 9% of companies eliminated prototypes completely by using virtual simulation. But it's not just prototype cost we're reducing. We've already talked about how virtual tools help you explore more complex designs and more options, ultimately leading to better products. So let's talk about product targets and what virtual simulation can do to help hit them. Now, virtual simulation tools have a positive effect on all product targets, from quality to timeline to cost targets. Have a quick look. And we're comparing companies here using virtual simulation versus hand calculations versus physical prototyping. In every single case, companies using virtual simulation are achieving their targets better and at a higher percentage rate than companies who are using other methods. This is pretty clear, guys. Virtual simulation helps companies hit their targets. Now, um, what does that have to do with SolidWorks? Well, where SolidWorks tools excel are the integration with your SolidWorks models and the ease of use. Let's take SOLIDWORKS flow simulation, for example, but, but the same things would really apply to flow simulation, our FEA tool, SOLIDWORKS simulation, as well as our plastics injection molding software. But we'll focus on flow. Well, for any CFD software to be useful for mainstream design, it needs to be used as part of the design process to make data-driven decisions. That means quick, easy to set up CFD that can be deployed quickly and that reacts quickly as the design changes. So why would flow simulation be the best tool for mainstream design? Well, firstly, and most importantly, flow simulation directly uses your native SOLIDWORKS geometry. Very few commercial CFD codes can do this. Even the ones that claim to, they typically copy the geometry to a new neutral format. Well, that breaks the link to the original files. With flow simulation, you're directly reading your SOLIDWORKS files. So your fluid domains created automatically. And when you change a design, changing a valve angle, changing an orifice size, etc., the fluid domain updates automatically. So it's less work for you. And it really is tightly integrated with CAD. Now, this also um, continues on to things like meshing. So in most CFD packages, creating an op the optimum mesh isn't easy. Um, although automatic meshers have been around for a long time, most packages still require a significant amount of manual intervention. And this manual work has to be repeated for every single design change. Well, flow simulation offers an extremely robust automatic mesher for both fluid and solid regions. So you can set up the mesh without much manual intervention at all. We have tools to automatically refine things around small geometric features or even physical features like gradients in the flow, whether it's a high velocity gradient, high pressure gradient, um, uh, high temperature gradient, etc. We can automatically refine in those regions without needing to predict where they'll happen to start with. We also feature grid independent near wall modeling using partial cell technology. And that lets us correctly simulate boundary layer phenomenon for fluid flow and heat transfer effects, again, without needing to put a lot of manual effort into it. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means flow simulation lets you do fast, useful CFD work that's tightly integrated into the design process. It's not an afterthought, it's not a verification, but it's a tool to help you make the right decisions during the design process. And let's talk a little bit more about that. When is the right time to use these simulation tools? Well, simulation should be used early in the design process. And um, we'll talk about why that is. What we want to do here, guys, is not design and then test. That can still give a lot of advantages over hand calculations and physical prototyping, but it's not the optimal use of virtual simulation tools. What we want to stress is testing while designing, what we call concurrent simulation. So um, as you're trying to deliver products faster and decrease time to market, you need to get as close to the right decision as you can, as fast as you can. And that's not done with long cycles of designing through and doing a verification test and then redesigning. It's by using simulation as a parallel task during the design process. And 
What does that look like? Well, a typical process might start with a project concept, move into design phase, and then testing, then manufacturing, then delivery. And what we're hoping to do with concurrent simulation, and I say hoping, uh, what companies are actively doing with simulation, what best-in-class companies are doing, is compressing this design cycle. They're doing design and testing concurrently and using these tools to make quick decisions. It's not something where you need to run a, a three-day massive test on a part. Run quick and dirty tests as you go. It's much easier to keep a project on track than it is to bring a project back on track once you've fallen off the rails. So um, by doing this, we can save large amounts of time and with large amounts of time, we can bring those products to market faster and save pretty large amounts of money as well. So hopefully guys, today we've talked a little bit about why simulation is useful early in the design cycle and why best in class companies are already taking advantage of it. And, I'd like to talk about some conclusions here. Product complexity is going to continue to grow. It's not gonna start getting simpler, it's just going to continue getting more complex, and manual methods really can't keep up. Now, there's also a constant lack of resources among manufacturers, and with this, um, you need to provide designers the tools to maximize their efforts. And it's not hand calculations, it's not prototyping, it's virtual simulation tools. And the best virtual simulation tools are ones like that found in the SolidWorks suite that are tightly integrated with CAD, and they provide the best productivity for concurrent simulation. Now, again, simulate early, simulate often, and keep your design on track. You'll be one of those best-in-class companies and, and see some of that best-in-class benefit. So, with that, guys, thank you for attending. If you'd like to learn more about any of our simulation products or see how simulation might benefit your company's design cycle, please get in touch with myself or anybody at Javelin. We're happy to show you more about our simulation products and how they can help your business.